tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It's a dangerous highway to begin with. After a horrific crash on the Sea to Sky Highway, calls for a ban on luxury car rallies also. Oh, I'm so excited to talk about a happy story with a baby whale. Meet J57, the orca who carried her dead calf on a tour of grief, gives birth again. And Really, Hogan's Alley really represents what a community can be. The message behind the mural in an East Vancouver neighborhood. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us online. Two years after a heartbreaking loss, the J-Pod of endangered killer whales off BC's coast is welcoming a new member tonight. Here's Briar Stewart on how the baby orca and her mom are doing. In the waves off Washington State, a rare sighting of a super pod of southern resident killer whales. They were breaching and playing. Among the group, a brand new baby, just a day or two old. I actually punched my coworker in the shoulder and said, there's a calf. Sarah McCullough was the first to lay eyes on the calf, known as J57. Well, a newborn is always cause for celebration, this birth is special. The mother orca is J35. In 2018, people around the world were moved by her apparent act of mourning. She carried her dead calf for 17 days, 1,600 kilometers, before finally letting go. In July, scientists learned that she was pregnant again. To have her have a calf was just heartwarming, not only for her, but for the entire community, that with these animals being so critically endangered, every life matters. Researchers say the whale appears healthy, even precocious. They're cautiously optimistic. There is only a 50% survival rate for the first year. So this, the next 12 months are going to be incredibly important, not just obviously for the survival of the individual calf, but for the population trajectory as a whole. Because the southern residents number just 73. Their primary food is Chinook salmon and those fish are becoming scarce too. There are also concerns around pollution and noise emanating from marine traffic. The orcas typically hunt in the Salish Sea in the summer, but there have been few sightings this year. With the absence of our southern residents in these waters for so much of what is historically their native feeding grounds, their fishing grounds, it really says that when the shells are bare, the whales aren't there. They're having to go farther. Which is why a new whale is such a welcome addition for a group that's still struggling to survive. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. There are calls tonight to put the brakes on luxury car rallies on the Sea to Sky Highway. It follows a terrible accident Saturday near Whistler that left several people injured, including two children. As Eva Yuguen Senge reports, police are investigating the actions of two rally drivers, including one who was behind the wheel of a powerful Lamborghini. Police say this Lamborghini was driving north on the Sea to Sky on Saturday around noon. It got into an accident with a Range Rover, spun out of control and into oncoming traffic. It collided with this Toyota. Passengers from both vehicles were sent to hospital, including two children who are in stable condition. Traffic was backed up for hours following the incident as collision crews were on the scene. Whistler RCMP say the collision is under investigation and that we have seen far too much tragedy on the Sea to Sky Highway to last us all a lifetime. We can only implore those in our area to slow down. Everyone who visits us wants to get to their destination safe and sound. The Lamborghini was part of the Hublot Diamond Rally. It's a supercar convoy that drives the Sea to Sky to raise money for charity. One local politician feels the luxury car rallies are sending the wrong message. The whole value proposition of these vehicles is that they go fast and they're fun to go fast in. And this highway really wasn't meant to, uh, to be uh, for people to be going fast. Um, we want people to go at the speed limit and, and drive safely for the conditions. Another supercar rally is scheduled for September 19. Some people want the events banned from the sea to sky. It's a dangerous highway to begin with and then to have inexperienced drivers driving very fast cars it feels uh, ridiculous it feels like it shouldn't be allowed 
perhaps there would be a way to find a place, some abandoned highway where they could go and just have their fun or a racetrack somewhere. But organizers of the rally say it's safe. The highway drive is not part of the event. Like the Sea to Sky Highway is a touring route up to the Pemberton event. We remind all participants to, to um, abide by posted speeds, traffic, traffic safety laws must be followed at all times, and they sign an agreement that they will uphold that. Rally organizers say the event raises money for many charities and that they're cooperating with the RCMP investigation. Eva Yuguen Senj, CBC News, Vancouver. And just a short time ago, there was another crash on the Sea to Sky Highway, this time near Britannia Beach. The seriousness of the crash isn't yet known, but the Ministry of Transportation says only the right lane is blocked going northbound. Delays in both directions are expected in the evening. Another update coming later tonight. We'll have that on our television broadcast right after the hockey game. And less than 24 hours after Saturday's crash, the driver of another high-performance sports car had his vehicle impounded by police on the same highway. Squamish RCMP sharing this photo of the Ferrari that they'll be taking care of for the next seven days. They caught it going 189 kilometers an hour in an 80 kilometer an hour zone through Porto Cove. Well, COVID-19 has certainly sparked a number of business closures in our city, but so far none as big as the Vancouver Aquarium. One of the city's top tourist attractions closed its doors to visitors just an hour ago. The aquarium was forced to close back in March because of the pandemic. At the time, its president warned it was facing bankruptcy. By late June, it reopened, operating at about 25% capacity. Guests were understandably a little down when we were there just a few hours ago. As a family, uh, my wife and I are feeling very sad about the closure. Uh, we're going to tell our oldest daughter after we've had our visit today. Now that we hear that they're closing, we want to make uh, an exception, come out here, especially with this guy's first time coming out. Uh, wanted him to experience it. And for all those people who don't get the chance to do that or didn't know it was closing, like it's a little sad. sad. Yeah. No word on when the aquarium will reopen to visitors. 209 employees have been laid off. But a team of 75 specialists is staying on to care for 58,000 animals that call the aquarium home. Squamish RCMP asking hikers to assess their skill level and know the risks. After one woman died and two others were badly injured hiking trail systems in the Squamish Valley. Police say a woman in her 30s was walking the Sigurd Trail Loop yesterday with her hiking partner when they were on a steep technical portion. She slipped on the rocks and fell a considerable distance. An RCMP helicopter helped Squamish search and rescue find the woman, but she had died of her injuries. On Friday, a Surrey woman was hiking with a friend when she fell into Crooked Falls. She was airlifted to hospital where she's recovering from serious injuries. And in a separate incident on the same day, crews responded to a call, a fall rather, from a mountain in the Tantalus Range just north of Squamish. A man was rappelling down a mountain when a rock came loose in his hand. He slid down 40 meters but walked away with only a minor hairline fracture to his leg. Well, uniform members rallied against grocery giant Loblaws today, supporting striking members in Newfoundland. All across the country, we are in front of superstores, shoppers, drug marts, Loblaws to make sure that the billionaire Galen Weston knows that uniform members and workers across the country are tired of just platitudes about being COVID heroes. They want the pay to go with it. Dozens of protesters turned out to the superstore on Grandview in Vancouver as part of a cross-Canada Labor Day protest. They're demanding fair pay and more full-time jobs for the 1,400 workers in Newfoundland who've been on strike since August 22nd. Loblaws posted a bump in earnings in the first quarter of 2020, a $42 million increase over last year. Negotiations between the two sides are currently at an impasse. And the United Truckers Association staged a car rally this Labor Day over a dispute with its commissioner. The association says unlicensed trucks are moving containers from the Port of Vancouver within the Lower Mainland at discounted prices. They say that undermines licensed fee-paying companies. The Commissioner and the Transport Ministry have initiated a study looking into the issue. 
Well, the city of Vancouver says its network of slow streets has been a success so far, and now it's looking for more feedback on the program. The project came as part of the response to the pandemic. Its aim to encourage more cycling and walking by introducing traffic calming measures around Vancouver. So far, city planners say feedback has been positive, with the biggest complaint being that there's still too much vehicle traffic on those slow streets. Residents are being asked to fill out the survey at shapeyourcity.ca to help determine what happens next. Well, the Vancouver Mural Festival has certainly brightened up our city during the pandemic. And this year, more black identifying artists contributed to the festival than ever before. But one piece in particular is rich in symbolism as it creates hope through the ashes of historic Hogan's Alley. So the mural behind me that I'm painting with fellow artists is called Hope Through Ashes, a requiem for Hogan's Alley. The idea behind the mural is very much to bring into more of a spotlight, acknowledge and pay tribute to the area of Strathcona, aka Black Strathcona, that was Hogan's Alley, but also to pay tribute to some of the people who live there. This is Vi Moore and Robert Moore and they ran a happening famous chicken and steak, AKA soul food restaurant. There's even photos of people like Sammy Davis Jr. even being at the spot. In 1967, the city of Vancouver ordered the demolishing of the neighborhood so as to create the viaduct. There is a significant somber tone in the mural in that it's being painted on the very instrument that led to the demolishing of Hogan's Alley. I wanted to show that the black community was just as much a part of Vancouver as any other community within Vancouver. It's extremely important to see black art in Vancouver. A lot of people like to focus on the fact that the black population in Vancouver is only 1%, and so it's easy to just discount wanting to include the black community in anything, but especially art. Um, but people need to understand that 1% is still a community that exists. And to be invisible and to have a history of erasure and not have any kind of visibility is problematic. So it's extremely important to amplify black voices, to amplify black art. In taking down Hogan's Alley, Vancouver ultimately took down a part of itself, an internal conflict that hopefully one day we can come back from and rectify by rebuilding a community that benefits everyone. High-profile critic of Russian President Vladimir Putin, who was poisoned last month, is now out of an induced coma. Alexei Navalny is being treated in Germany, and as the CBC's Chris Brown reports, Russian authorities have yet to open an investigation. Friends and family of Alexei Navalny are no doubt very relieved with this news from the Charité Hospital today. The statement says that Navalny is now out of a coma. The ventilator that he has been on for the last three weeks is now being removed and he is even responding to verbal stimuli. All good news. On the other hand, the release says there's no word yet on what possible long-term damage he might have suffered. Navalny was flying on a plane over Siberia back to Moscow on August the 20th when he collapsed and became violently ill. The pilot landed the plane, an emergency landing, and if he hadn't done that, uh, doctors said that very well could have been it for Alexei Navalny. He was airlifted not long after the, uh, to Germany, where German doctors claim they found evidence of Novichok, a weapons-grade nerve agent, on his skin, uh, also in his urine, in his blood, and also in a water bottle uh, that he had been drinking from. Russian authorities have not opened uh, an, an investigation into murder in this case, much to the dismay 
of Navalny supporters. Instead, Russian TV has been flooded with alternative explanations. They've claimed that maybe Navalny did this to himself somehow, low blood sugar. They're suggesting maybe the Germans poisoned him on the plane. Perhaps this was a CIA plot. News of his improving condition could well affect the calculus that goes into deciding what kind of political or economic sanctions play out from this. Western nations are trying to take a joint approach. Uh, NATO has already met once. There have been other meetings between different foreign ministers. The key player in this is Germany. It is involved in the building of a very lucrative, very important natural gas pipeline between Russia and Germany under the Black Sea. Angela Merkel, until now, has said Nord Stream 2 will not be part of any political calculations involving sanctions against Russia, but she's under intense pressure in Germany, and her tone on that seems to be shifting. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. The black man shot in the back by police in Kenosha, Wisconsin last month is speaking out tonight. Jacob Blake released a video from his hospital bed over the weekend. Your life, and not only just your life, your legs, something that you need to move around and move forward and life can be taken from you like this, man. Blake's spinal cord was severed when a white police officer shot him in the back seven times. The shooting ignited another wave of unrest in the U.S. with several nights of protests. And athletes in several professional sports staged a series of unprecedented boycotts. Well, as the world braces for a second wave of COVID-19 infections, some countries are already seeing huge surges in cases. India is being hit very hard and has now overtaken Brazil as the country with the second highest number of infections after the U.S. Cindy Palm takes a look tonight at some of the global hotspots. India says one reason the numbers are up is because of increased testing. The world's second most populous country saw 90,000 cases today, taking its total to more than 4 million. At this rate, it could pass America's 6 million cases by next month. The concern is that COVID will spread from big cities like Delhi and Mumbai to the hinterland where the majority of people live. Despite showing no signs of stopping, some Indian cities continue to loosen restrictions on transportation and businesses to try to rescue an economy in deep trouble. Millions of people have lost their jobs and the GDP shrank by a quarter in June. Other parts of the world are also seeing a surge. The UK recorded 3,000 cases on Sunday, the highest jump since May. The government says most of the new infections involve young people. This argument that we've seen, you know, that some people come out with saying, uh, you, do, you know, you don't need to worry about a rise in cases because it's younger people and they don't die. Firstly, they can get very, very ill. And secondly, um, inevitably it leads to older people catching it from them. So don't infect your grandparents. Other European countries are not faring any better. Spain is set to top half a million cases, although it's less deadly than in March and April when 800 people died a day. The Spanish health ministry recorded 19 deaths on Friday. Closer to home, coronavirus cases have been reported in numerous schools in Quebec since classes resumed last week, leading to concerns as students return in other parts of the country. Canada's chief medical officer warned cases in schools are inevitable, but that the pandemic was under manageable control. Cindy Palm, CBC News, London. A windstorm knocked out power to thousands of homes in the lower mainland of Vancouver Island this afternoon. The windstorm was strong enough to topple power lines in Maple Ridge onto this car. Fortunately, the family inside was able to get out safely. As of about an hour ago, there were 3,700 customers in the lower mainland, 3,500 customers on the island affected by outages. Gusts of up to 70 kilometers an hour are expected into the evening. And we're joined now by Johanna Wagstaff. So uh, that wind uh, still with us in uh, some parts of Metro Vancouver throughout the evening. 
still seeing gusts tonight, Mike, up to 50, even 70 kilometers per hour. What a day it was, though, across the south coast and, in fact, across the southern half of B.C. with wind gusts through the Okanagan approaching 60 uh, kil kilometers per hour as well. Let me show you the current gusts across the south coast. Things have really calmed down now, although we're still looking for those outflow winds through the overnight. Abbotsford seeing wind gusts to 40 kilometers per hour right now, and Victoria Harbour is still around 35. But, yes, 70-plus uh, earlier today. Uh, didn't see the wind gusts as much in downtown Vancouver. YVR not really reporting the gusts higher than 35. I've actually set the isobar, so the pressure, to 7 a.m. this morning. This is how we get winds when the pressure gradient is really tight. So you can see how close those lines are together. That's when those winds really picked up this morning as a big high pressure rapidly built in place. This was a really unusual setup. If any of you uh, have, you know, migraine associated headaches, uh, today was an interesting day with that pressure rising so quickly. Current temperatures were at a 24 and through Vancouver, looking to see things warm up over the next couple of days. In fact, Wednesday and Thursday will be even hotter. Our hottest day coming in close to 31 for parts of Metro Vancouver. Looks like we cool down a little bit for Friday into the weekend, but this very strong high pressure will stick around. It's going to be a, an, a very summer-like uh, first week back to school for uh, many students, Mike. Well, summer's not over yet. Sounds good. Thanks, Joe. Well, the beginning of September traditionally means the start of school, but at one school in B.C., the kids have been back in class for six weeks. It had to make plenty of changes before opening its doors, but as Briar Stewart explains, for everyone involved, the new routines are starting to feel normal. Yes, sir. Even as the McKay children wait for the bus, they're getting a lesson in spacing out. Well, we put the chairs in place um, uh, six feet apart just to get the kids' mindset started on that they need to start social distancing. But this is now routine on the Lytton First Nation as students headed back to class at the end of July. There is screening before they get on the bus. Morning, Lucas. And once they arrive at school. No coughing, no runny nose, no fever. Stein Valley Nilakutmuk School is independent and follows a year-round schooling model. Students are taught academic classes alongside the Nilakutmuk language and traditional skills like canning. This was the first public or independent school in BC to go back after the summer break and initially there was a lot of fear. We've had a long history uh, of losing many of our people through pandemics. And so I needed to be sure that what, what we were presenting to the community and to the board and to the staff and the parents was actually something that they could buy into. Ready? Joanne Limbo Bolin and her husband were conflicted. I, I didn't want to send my children to school at first, but then being at home since March, it's, it's pretty tolling on their mental health as well as, as, well as the parents. Her concerns were eased because there hasn't been any cases of COVID-19 in the community and because of the precautions the school has taken. Class sizes were capped at no more than 15 students. Two extra teachers were hired. Signs have been put up throughout the school. Arrows are in the hallway indicating which direction students should travel in. All the water fountains are off limits because they're high touch surfaces, so students have been given a water bottle instead. The lockers are closed off too to prevent students from congregating in the hallways. Young students were also given pool noodles to help them spread out. In many ways, this school is well positioned for the new health guidelines. It's large and there's plenty of outdoor space, including a farm which the students take care of. Nearly all of the 102 students who go here have returned to class. A positive thing, says the school's administrator, because many struggled with remote learning. The vast majority of our kids that really need that structure, that routine, that instruction, that connection. And they're getting that now, even if the school days look a little different. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Lytton, First Nation. Well, thanks for watching online this evening. We will have a television newscast a little later on, probably at around 7.30 or so, right after the hockey game. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you later.